Hello, and welcome back to my review for Star Trek Prodigy Season 2, Episodes 6 to 10. So in case you don't know, I decided um, to split my review up for Star Trek Prodigy into four videos. This is video number two, and that last Wednesday I uploaded uh, part one, which was my review for Episodes 1 to 5. And as I stated in this, ep uh, this one, I'm doing 6 to 10. Uh, just because of how long I think this video would have been if I'd done all 20 episodes in a season. Which, I'm not against doing that, but I want to split spread this out uh, even more so I can keep reminding people to please go watch Star Trek Prodigy Season 2 on Netflix. Because the more people watch it, the more Netflix is going to see that people want more of this and we'll get uh, greenlit a Season 3. So, yeah. Um, with that being said, uh, time to continue on my review with episode 6. Okay, so before I get into my review of the imposter syndrome, uh, the reason the face looks like this is because I have a skin condition called psoriasis. So I've used my spray on it to get rid of it. As you can tell, like if you skip back like 10 seconds, you'll see a bit of just how much of an improvement just having the spray on did. Um, so yeah, this should clear up in about a day. Anyway, The Imposter Syndrome, episode 6. Again, before I jump onto that, um, they did tweet out, uh, saying that the, there is some discrepancy with the titles. Like I mentioned for episode 5, um, that it, th what it showed in the title sequence was what the episode was supposed to be called. Um... So, I don't know if that's going to give spoilers for what's coming next for me. Because as I'm watching it, they obviously still haven't updated. And one of the episodes is entitled The Mirror Universe. Um, but in actual, I believe it's supposed to be called Closed Mirrors or something like that. Um... So, yeah, don't know if that's a spoiler alert or not, but uh, for, for that, well, I'll find out when I get towards the end of the season. So, yeah, imposter syndrome. What did I think of this episode? This one was definitely filler. This, this was definitely filler, served no real purpose, and I did not like it whatsoever. Um, so, the episode is basically about they're going to, uh, turns out they're going to destroy the Infinity, uh, big oh, due to orders of Starfleet and all records are to be scrubbed clean um, because you know they're not supposed to have a cloaked ship with uh, due to the treaty with the Romulans um, and so uh, like the only known ship that at this point in time that had a cloak uh, might not even have it at this point post Dominion War is the Defiant um, and so if they get caught with that, you know, the Federation as is will be like in deep hot doo-doo considering that they're trying to relocate a bunch of Romulans at this point. Um, and so the uh, Prod uh, the Protostar crew want to commandeer it to go to tr to the uh, this nebula that, um, that uh, Gwyn saw at the end of last week, last episode, I was about to say last week's episode, but no, last, the end of last episode, and there's one planet that has gone missing, so they're thinking that's where Chakotay is, um, and so they decide to, you know, because they're obviously going to be noticed, uh, if they've left, that they're going to create holograms, except Rock, um, makes them so well, that they don't even know that they're not holograms. And hijinks ensue. You know, they're trying, they leave, they lock our, the actual people into the holodeck thinking that they're holograms and all this stuff. It's, like I said, it's filler. It's not all that important. Certain scenes are important, but it's, it wasn't great. I'm going to be honest. Uh, it, it's out of the six episodes that I've watched, it's definitely the weakest um, and that's saying something with the for the opening two-parter. Because, you know, I'm glad Dell has mellowed out since uh, since the, the, the first two episodes. Because um, 
God, he was annoying. But yeah, uh, gotta go watch the next episode. Well, I'm gonna go get some lunch and then I'm gonna watch the next episode with, with food. Um, and then I'll be back uh, in a second for uh, to review episode seven. Okay, so I'm recording this as I literally just wrapped up uh, part one's review because I decided uh, last minute to split these up into four parts and then I just literally f uh, recorded the intro bit to this. So yeah, um, I have now watched episode seven and eight. So let's let's get started with episode seven, The Fast and the Curious, which is obviously a play on the movie franchise, The Fast and the Furious, which I think are the worst movies to have ever existed. Have I seen them? I think I've seen Too Fast and Too Furious or Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift. I've seen bits and pieces of one of them on VHS. Um, Never my thing. I'm not a car guy. Um, but then again, art is subjective. If you love the Fast and the Furious movie, movies, more power to you. You know, um, it's like I say, I personally don't like Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. I think it's a tad bit overrated. And you might love it. Uh, for me, the best Star Trek movie ever made is Star Trek First Contact. So yeah, uh, The Fast and the Curious. Um, well, it sees that it's going to take our Protostar crew 61 days to reach this, uh, where they're going to hopefully try and find Jakote. Um, and uh, they decide to actually take a shortcut because the computer also tells them of this inactive Borg trans warp drive. So, yeah. Uh, at this point in time, the Borg are, there's not really much we know about the Borg, uh, in, in this era. We know from last season that there was a dormant Borg cube that the Protostar crew found. We do, we do know from Star Trek Picard season one that there is, um, the cube that, uh, Hugh is on as well as uh, Soji from Picard season one. We also know from Picard season three that there's a hidden war cube in Jupiter. Um, but at this point in time, we, we assume that most of the Borg are inactive essentially because of the uh, virus that future Admiral Janeway gave in Endgame. And so, as they're traveling, some weird wasp-looking bug thing attaches onto the ship, forces them out of the transwarp drive, uh, transwarp tunnel, and forces them to remotely land on uh, a planet. And as they step out, it turns out that the Kazon are here. So yeah, the Kazon are making another uh, reappearance, because they did show up in Season 1 of Prodigy. Um, just as, you know, people to sell um, prisoners to uh, the Diviner. Uh, at this time, it's he, this one, uh, Kazon, is uh, trying to get people to race. And there's a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde situation going on with him, as we see. There's parts where he's acting like a proper Kazon, and then there's parts where he's acting a little timid and not wanting to do this. And so uh, he's like, okay, so you have two choices. You can either give me uh, a bunch of latinum for your f uh, freedom or your ships, or you give me your ship. Or there's this now third option of if you race one of my best racers and win, then you're free to go. So this is happening with, um, you know, Jankum, Dell, Gwyn, and Rock Talk, whereas Murph and Zero um, didn't get captured. So they're doing some investigating. And so the race goes on and uh, some of the fighters get destroyed and uh, Dell ends up crashing with the best racer and turns out that all these other Kazon are actually robots. 
and uh, so then they go, uh, they manage to figure it all out, um, and pull what was causing this uh, Kazon to have the Jekyll and Hyde situation, and we turn turns out that it's an evil robot uh, that has, well, an evil computer that has gained sentience. We've seen this happen before. It happened a lot in Star Trek, the original series, as well as uh, Star Trek Lower Decks, um, where we see a rogue AI become evil and take over a planet. This time it's only for a Kazon. And it's not the first, you know, our Prodigy crew aren't the first. We do see a pan down of different ships. One of them was a Federation ship. Um, I didn't quite catch the name or the registry, uh, but it was easily recognizable as a Federation ship. Um, so then they, uh, they're almost turned, you know, get these chips implanted on them to, to bring out their aggression. Uh, one gets put on Murph. That makes him go, uh, Stitch, you know, from Lilo and Stitch, we know with the forearms, uh, attacking and Zero, uh, basically flung, flungs herself into this chair with, with the evil AI and it, she successfully stops them, uh, stops this thing and they all get free, uh, except now there's a bit of a caveat. And that caveat is zero suit is damaged beyond repair. And because the infinity doesn't have what's what's needed and a lot of parts to rebuild zero, she is on or sorry, they are unfortunately left uh, there in, in the damaged containment suit because you know they're a Medusan. Um and as that's going on in Back on Voyager A, they still don't know that uh, our Protostar crew have gone missing. Um, because one thing I forgot to mention, what happened at the end of episode 6, is when they, the, um, the Hollows uh, reactivated, all their personalities switched. Um, and so, yeah, they don't notice it. You know, we have a scene in the mess hall with Janeway, uh, Rock refers to coffee as dirt water, um, which greatly offends Janeway because, you know, there's two things you should know about Janeway. She doesn't take shit from no one and she loves her coffee. I mean, she even, I she, she threatened fucking Neelix once, uh, not necessarily threatened about coffee. You know, he, he she comes in, she asks her coffee black it's like, oh, one of our, we lost another replicator, but let me get you this coffee supplement. She's like, nope, coffee, black, just get me coffee. You know, typical coffee drunker. Um, I agree with Rock Talk. I'm not a coffee fan. Uh, don't like the aftertaste. Um, but Morel um, notices something off with Gwyn and goes to... Uh, goes to her quarters to talk to her. And in the split second of Gwyn going into her quarters, um, and Morel and the entire crew starts to slow down as these weird tentacle little things um, go come, you know, go through the ship, go through to Gwyn's quarters and uh, disables the hollow. And that ends that episode, episode seven, the fast and the curious. It was an all right episode, definitely intriguing to see what's going to happen as the season progresses, you know, with what, uh, what is that tentacle thing? Um, and what's going to happen to zero. We do get an answer to that in the next episode, which I do love the title of this one. Is there in beauty? No truth. Because again, like I said, um, about a different episode, I wonder if it's in my notes here. Uh, do, 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 do. um, yeah, who saves the saviors? Feel that tied the title of who saves the saviors, and this one is there in beauty, no truth. Feels like an original series episode title, and I love that. You know, I love the fact that we, we're getting that. Um, so what is this episode about? Well, 
It's been a week since uh, The Fast and the Curious. Um, you know, Zero is still essentially trapped. And as they're going by this planet, Zero gets contacted by another Medusin, talking about how they can fix Zero, uh, give Zero a new body. And so everyone but Dell is all for going to this planet because Zero literally sacrificed everything to save them in last week's episode and has done so multiple times, uh, which is why Zero is one of my favorite characters in the whole of Prodigy. Um, for me, it goes Zero, Rock Talk, Gwyn, um, Murph, Jake and Pog, and Dell is down to the very, very rock bottom. Um, but, you know, he has definitely, me like I said, he's mellowed out since the first two episodes. Thank Christ for that one. Um, but anyway, yeah, so they go to this planet and it turns out that these other non-corporeal beings now have their own bodies. And so Zero, ha uh, you know, has to agree to uh, get her their own body. And so she she does. And so she, she gets to experience things, you know, touch, feel, hunger, um, you know, all these things that uh, in, as a Medusa normally can't experience as a non-corporeal being. But there were things that were left out. And that being uh, this festival that they're doing uh, is to make them experience these um, bodies experience fear that if they make it to the other side they'll usually not want to leave uh, because if they leave the planet their bodies start to deteriorate which I knew straight away because again this is, so this is something that has been done previously so that's what happens you know once you know Dell and Gwyn figure this out they try to warn um, Zero uh, eventually catch up and form Zero, <coughs> excuse me, and um, eventually they decide to leave. Uh, so that's that portion of the episode. And the next portion of the episode, uh, the B-plot essentially, which is very, very quick, um, is we see the Hollow Prodigy crew uh, in a game against the um, the... Uh, Nova Squad, um, and they eventually figure out, thanks to the Doctor, that he's the one who implanted the uh, idea to create other hollows. And so they, you know, tell the ship to turn off any other hollow that isn't the EMH. They all disappear, except for Gwyn's hollow. Gwyn's hollow hasn't been seen uh, in two or three days. And so they reconstruct the hollow uh essentially wake her up they inform her that we know all uh, what's go most of what's going on and so she starts talking about these that the time has stopped because but from the moment of Gwyn going into her room and morel going up to the room there was eight minutes lost of recorded time um and so there's definitely something afoot and that's where the episode ends so again I love the title. It was a good episode. I enjoyed it. Um, so episodes 9 and 10 is going to be a two-parter. Um, so yeah, that's basically so far, you know, The Fast and the Curious uh, it, is okay. Episode 6, um, not the greatest uh, in my personal opinion, uh, but I'm looking forward to, to watching episodes 9 and 10 another two-parter which had things gone the way they did I think this would have been a mid-series I think this is the mid-season finale you know if it were to be split up like season one was uh where we got 10 episode blocks and uh 10 first 10 episode block and then we got then later on we would have gone and second ep 10 episode block uh overall I'm enjoying this season I'm curious to see how things go so, yeah, I'm going to go watch uh, the next two episodes and uh, then I'll be back in a second to review them. So, episodes 9 and 10. I have, just from episode 9, almost a full fucking page of notes. 
So let's begin. So the episode opens with our prodigy crew making it to the location of where they need to be and they realize that there should be a planet there so they pull it out of phase and then they land and they go exploring thinking that you know this is where Jakote is um then they see a door from the 20th century and that should have been my tip off but it wasn't um and a someone ends up coming out of that door and it's fucking Wesley Crusher. I was not expecting this. I was not expecting another return of Wesley Crusher to Star Trek. So that is his technically fourth time returning to Star Trek because he was in the opening scene of Nemesis and he did have a speaking role, but that was cut. We then, of course, see him in the season finale of Star Trek Picard Season 2. And then he reprised his role again for a quick voice cameo in Star Trek Lower Deck Season 4. And now he's back for these two episodes. <laughs> Gotta hand it to the, to the Prodigy writers. They, 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 I was not expecting to see Will Wheaton return uh, as Wesley Crusher. So, there's a bit of an A and a B plot. So, going to temper the A plot with Wesley and our Prodigy crew for a moment as we go back to the Voyager A. Um, as they have followed the warp trail of the Infinity to the um the borg uh slipstream tunnel and just prior to them entering it uh admiral janeway gets a hail from uh admiral jellico edward jellico is back like i said in my season five uh, what well, not my season five in my episodes one to five we're part one review i know he's in at least eight episodes so this is two there are six more for for him to appear because when i looked up to see if it was the actual actor reprising his role that's how i knew he uh jellico is going to be in eight episodes and you know jellico's like he's trying to again order janeway back and to go about the through the proper starfleet channels of requesting to go look for her prodigy crew. And then there's a callback to when Seven of Nine goes missing. And I think Dark Frontier part one and two. Where where Janeway repeats the same uh, line that she gave to Naomi in that two-parter uh, about finding Seven. Um, uh, which I liked because I love that that little little mini speech that uh, Janeway gives. Uh, so I was very happy to to hear that again. So yeah, we're we're seeing more Watcher Wesley. Um, it's just going down my nose. But anyway, yeah. So the they go through the transwarp conduit, um, and they appear on the planet. Uh, well, they they of course get the planet to be in phase and that. Uh, so now I'm going to park the B plot to go back to the A plot. So Wesley uh, is trying, he, he's the one who's been helping our our crew, the, the Prodigy crew, uh, to help find, um, to help find Jakote. And he, he brings them into this room, gets them to do this talking, all these, all this techno babble stuff. And... He mentions the different timelines, and I have them, I have them written down here. So we get mention of the Prime timeline or the Prime universe, which is the universe that we're in for this. We get mention of the Mirror universe. We get mention yet again of the Narada incursion, which is the Kelvin timeline. So he's aware of that. We get mention of fluidic space, which again harkens back to Scorpion parts one and two. 
um, which were when we get introduced to Seven of Nine, Species 84762, or if you play Star Trek Online, they're referred to as the Undine. And then we also get reference to uh, the Mycelium uh, network, you know, from Star Trek uh, Picard, not Star Trek Picard, Star Trek Discovery um, with the Spore Drive. And he says, oh, you're not supposed to know about that. Forget I ever said that. Realizing that, remembering that the whole Mycenaeal network stuff is massively classified by this point in time. Because uh, if anyone was to look up USS Discovery, NCC-1031, they'll know that it was actually destroyed um, when helping the Enterprise at the end of Season 2 of Discovery. But we obviously know she went into the 31st century. So, yeah, he then brings up these cosmic scavengers, these creatures that um, scavenge dying timelines uh, uh, in order to feast on anomalies and anything that's in there. Uh, meaning that if it eats you, it erases you from ever have existing. And which is, to me, a nod to season five of Doctor Who or series five of Doctor Who with the whole time fracture cracks in time and stuff. You know, if you go into these cracks of times, you cease to exist. Um, so yeah, we'll be in for Doctor Who, by the way, I, with the way he's going on about all of this stuff, um, you know, uh, all the techno babble and the way he's just giddy with excitement reminded me so much of the Doctor um, themselves. So I kind of fan cast Will Wheaton as, as the next Doctor or any Doctor would be great in my opinion. I think Will Wheaton would kill it. Um, anyway, back to the the episode. Um, so uh, time starts to slow down. Um, you know, uh, Wesley realizes it. He presses his own little uh, thing on the wrist to be able to interact when the loom, because that's what they're called, um, slows down time to be able to eat people. Um, he then grabs, uh, no, actually that doesn't happen. He's, he's already able to interact when time slows down because Gwyn with her wristband is able to realize that. So they go running off um, and we, you know, we get to see what the loom look like. Very interesting design. Um, very, very interesting design. And then he runs to uh, this place. He, he he opens it up. It's full of phaser rifles and the bands that they need to give to the others to be able to interact when time slows down. I also noticed what looked to be Enterprise E, a model of the Enterprise E, which is interesting because I thought it would have, it would have been the Enterprise D because uh, Rock was the only one who recognized Wesley as being Wesley Crusher. The rest hadn't obviously read up on Federation history um, to know who Wesley was. Uh, so they, you know, Wesley and Gwyn, they race back, they put the bands on everyone else and they go into one of the Watchers um, studio, the exact Watcher from the season two uh, backdoor pilot finale of uh, Star Trek, the original series. That episode being Assignment Earth. I literally had to pull out my uh, DVD here to find it. Took took a quick second to find the name of the episode because I honestly completely forgot. And um, that is where part one ends. And it's a great part. It, it I Like I said, I was pleasantly surprised to see Wesley. Like I knew there's going to be homages to at least Voyager, you know, Obviously, we have uh, the EMH, we have Admiral Janeway, uh, Chakotay has shown up from time to time, um, uh, the Voyager A. Uh, did not expect Wesley. Uh, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. Um, so, yeah, now we get on to part two, where we've learned, we kind of learned that the uh, travelers. You know what Wesley's a part of, and what was in um, Annihilation Earth. Uh, was that the name of the episode? I literally just said it, and I fucking forgot it. Uh, is this it? No, the one before. Uh, assignment Earth. 
Uh, I got... I'm really bad at names. Anyway, yeah, so... Um, they're in the exact same one from uh, 1968, which was the time frame that it was designed off of. And so then we leave the our, our people for a bit as we go back to Voyager A, because part two is mainly centered around Voyager A. The EMH has made another band for, for a bunch of people for the away mission. Uh, three people go down, Tyrus, uh, the first officer, uh, Majel, the Vulcan, um, a Nova Squad member and just a random person and because mo uh, uh, most people up on Voyager don't have the, the bands uh, they forget about the random red shirt that gets eaten because you know uh, this is where Wesley explains that if you get caught by these things they will erase you from all the time and space and we see that happen and so by time uh, the first officer uh, beams up because Miguel actually, whilst mid-beam, takes off her comm badge and throws it um, to go and find Zero because that's the only reason why she's on this away mission because she's uh, psychically linked to Zero. Um, and initially, uh, Will was going to let, uh, you know, Miguel die essentially because he didn't want to risk uh the loom finding out where they were um but that is when Dell says no we're uh, you might not want to save her but I'm going to save her and so he brings her in uh and at that point they all leave because the loom is starting to descend onto the place and they run out the loom have disintegrated uh the ship that they were on uh, entirely uh, removed it from time and just as they got out we see the Voyager A in Earth's atmosphere firing on these on the loom the loom goes up onto the uh, onto Voyager uh, starts to disintegrate a bunch of people um, a bunch of nobodies that we don't really know the name of but of course it's the crew uh, Janeway always cares about her crew doesn't matter who uh, or what you are if you're part of her crew she will literally do everything in our power to save you um and so a whole bunch of running around Janeway ends up on a shuttle um and tries to fight them and this is where she's in her rambo looking uh uniform from year of hell you know the the vest um the gray vest that she wore in year of hell which is my personal favorite look for Janeway and um you know crashes the shuttle meets up with uh will with um wesley uh instantly recognizes him uh obviously um and then it turns out that you know Wes uh wesley thought that it was the six prodigy crew that was needed to track the location uh where the protostar was um but after that it's not that case. He also warns them whilst he's look using their time stream to find it, warns them not to look at, at their potential future. Dell does, and the scene that he sees is him saying to Gwen, um, I shouldn't be captain, that chair was not meant for me. Uh, that upsets him, annoyingly so, because uh, you know, Dell has always has gotten it in his head since season one that oh, he's the captain, he makes all the shots, he calls all the shots. Uh but no, he shouldn't be captain. Um, and I agree with the potential future self, his future self saying that he should that he doesn't deserve the chair. My guess is this is going to be a case of he says this when we get to that point. Um, but Gwen convinces him that no, no, you are definitely the captain. It should be you, and makes him see that he he is captain and should be, uh, should be the captain. Um, and a captain and such. Um, and then it turns out that it's actually Majol, uh, the Vulcan, who is the seventh mo uh, key. So it has to be all seven of them to go. And they, en they enter into the portal and the um, Wesley sends uh, Janeway back up on to uh, Voyager. And it looks like he self-sacrifices himself to stop the loom and also destroy the, essentially it looks like he destroyed the planet. Uh, but if I was a betting man, 
uh, my guess is I'm uh, I'm looking at this in three dimensions when I should be looking at this in four dimensions that you know since he is a traveler um there is I think he survives uh, obviously I don't know because I've only watched it up as far as episode 10 here um so I'm I'm sure as I go on watch the next 10 episodes uh, the second half of the season I'll find out uh, but yeah that is going to wrap this video up that's another five episodes down I've now reviewed episodes one to ten in two parts uh, part three episodes 11 to 15 will be posted next Wednesday um, but I'll have already have seen it because uh, I'm I'm recording this actually on the 2nd of July um, I'm more than likely going to watch another two or three episodes tonight uh, and probably have this finished by sometime uh, Friday, uh, Thursday or Friday, um, the 3rd or 5th, uh, the 4th or 5th of July. So I'll probably have already known, but because I'm, I want to do this weekly to, again, if you haven't watched Star Trek Prodigy yet, um, even though I just spoiled a whole bunch of, uh, uh important stuff, please do go watch it. It's on Netflix. Um, the more people that watch it, the more likely we are to get a season three. So please, please, please go watch Prodigy season two on netflix this is not sponsored this is just me wanting one of my new favorite shows to continue uh so yeah that is going to wrap us up thank you all for watching i hope you enjoyed and i shall see you all on friday uh for a another classic doctor who review voted for by you i'll see you all for that one